My name is Jennifer McLaughlin and I am the Senior Assistant Director of Career Services and this is the first in a series of programs that we have developed specifically for teacher education majors. This is the resume and cover letter. A couple of announcements. In this purple employment guide for teacher candidates, the job search timetable that is in there is last year. So the goldenrod is this year. So stick it in there and, and don't, don't look at that one. Look at this one. And then I also want to encourage you to read this book, the 2014 Job Search Handbook, which is developed by the American Association for Employment and Education. I, I think it's excellent and it's got a lot of very good information in it. All right, let's start then. All right, Career Services. Our main office is located over in Hoyt. Have any of you been there before? Some of you? Okay. I also have an office over in Phillips, which is closer to McGuffey and probably closer for most of you. So if it's better for you to come over to Phillips, just let me know. And then also, for those of you who are student teaching and you'd like to make an appointment with me, I'm more than happy to meet after 5 o'clock. Just, just let me know why that you're student teaching and, and give me a time that would be best for you. And I'll, I'll certainly make arrangements for you, make room for you in my schedule. When you came in, you picked up, in addition to the books I just mentioned, you picked up an overview of services brochure, which gives you an idea of the various kinds of services that we offer. In particular, I want to point out mock interview service. Has anybody done a mock interview with us? Okay. What was it, Can, what was it like? Okay, so you did the mock interview event, all right. There are two different mock interview programs, and if you can do one of each, I would really encourage it. The first one is the daily mock interviews that we record. So we have one of our, our trained mock interviewers asking you specific questions that you, would, you might get asked by a principal or a superintendent or somebody from human resources. So we try to make it as real to life as possible, and it's videotaped which I know for some of you is scary, but it also, until you see yourself on tape, you don't really get the idea of maybe what some of your habits are that you, you need to work on. And then the one, the event that this young woman was talking about, at least once a year, we have a mock interview event for teacher education majors where we invite principals, superintendents, teachers, retired principals, etc., to come and do mock interviews with you. Those are not videotaped, but I think they're excellent in terms of, in a safe environment, giving you feedback on what your interviewing skills are like. Now, the next brochure that I want to talk about is the program brochure. And if you open that, in the middle part, education workshops and events. The next program that is specifically for you is on Wednesday, October 23rd, Making Employer Contacts and Interviewing. I do the part on interviewing and this year Jean Eagle is going to do a presentation on like what employers are looking for, giving you some tips on how to conduct your job search. And then in the spring, we always do a teacher job fair. This year it's going to be on Thursday, April 3rd, and it's an all-day event. You'll, you'll get more about that. But again, there's some other information in here that you might be interested in. Another program that I wanted to bring to your attention is a panel that we are going to have on Tuesday, October 29th from 5.30 to 7 p.m. in, this, in these rooms. It was in response to, it's called Alternative Careers for Education Majors. It was in response to what we've been hearing that some education majors would like to know, in addition to teaching, is there something else I can do with my degree? And that's not necessarily because they've decided they don't want to teach, although there certainly are those students who do that, but it's also just like, what are, what are my other options? So the panel that we have put together um, three of them are graduates of the teacher education program and one of them is somebody who's interested in hiring you. First one, Christine Willig, is with McGraw-Hill Education. They're the ones that publish Scholastic Magazine and other ones. Do you remember? You, know, you probably still see Scholastic Magazine. And then Joan Lewis, who's currently Senior Vice President for Procter & Gamble. Robert Hendricks, 
who used who currently works as a program director down in Hamilton for the Booker T. Washington Center, and then Sarah Huffman, who will in the in the winter time, um, she has she was appointed for the Ohio Legislative Fellowship Program. I think there's actually a longer name for that. So they're going to give you their views, their, their kind of ideas about what else you can do with an education degree. You'll get more information about that. What we're going to talk about tonight are what are the purposes of a resume, because it's not just a piece of paper. It's a very important piece of paper. We're also going to talk about how do you begin it, how do you organize a resume, because that really is probably the most important thing. You can't just list things in, in uh, chronological order and expect somebody to, to read it. How much time do you think a human resource person, or actually anybody, if you go to teach your job fair, how much time do you think somebody looks at your resume before they make a decision about whether or not you're a good candidate? Anybody? Probably about 10 seconds, more, more if you're lucky. That's why I was, I was emphasizing before that you want to make sure you highlight what your, what your major is and what your licensure is. Not, not a very long time. So how you format your resume and how easy it is for me to scan it is a very important part. Content suggestions, so we're going we're to talk about that. How do you lay out your resume? How you, the production and the printing of it, and then we're going to spend some time talking about cover letters. The purpose of a resume. The purpose of a resume is, number one, to get whoever is reading that interested in you as a candidate. So it's also it's a summary of your background, your experiences, and your skills. When I look at it, I want to be able to figure out, are you a good candidate? Can you meet what I am looking for? Do you have an understanding of what the position is? And how can your experiences and your skills help me as an employer, help me with help our school district? Also, remember first impressions. If this is the first time they've had any contact with you at all, they don't know what you look like, they don't know if you come across well in an interview, it's going to create a first impression, good, bad, or indifferent. And let, let's hope that it's a good first impression if you've taken some time to write it. And then also it has a life of its own after you first read it. Sometimes if, a, if an HR person is looking for somebody specific, it's because a principal at a school has said, hey, I need somebody to teach um, English in you know, our middle school. Do you have anybody? So yes, I do have somebody. So the HR person takes it to, or emails it, or faxes it, or scans it to the person that needs that particular person, needs that particular kind of a person. So it's got a life of its own after the first initial reading. So what should a resume illustrate? It should talk about what your qualifications are as they relate to the position you're applying for. So in your case, it's more than likely going to be a teaching position, or if it's going to be a teaching position with a coaching position, you want to talk about that, what your skills are. And I think probably a good way of doing that is if you've got a job description and there are some specific skills that are mentioned and you've got them, incorporate them into the body of your resume so that when you're describing what your experiences were as a student teacher, you talk about them. So for example, if they're looking for somebody who's got good technology skills, and you have incorporated technology into your teaching, talk about that. Don't just make your resume kind of a laundry list of, you know, my responsibilities were. Actually talk about how you incorporated technology into possibly a lesson plan. So your skills, your competencies, what your interests are, what your achievements are, what your academic background is, which, which I've talked about before, general knowledge and what your potential is. Now general knowledge and potential I think are somewhat esoteric, but you know again, when I'm looking at your resume, I'm making a decision. Are you someone who really wants to be a teacher? Are you somebody who I think would be a good fit for our district? So the primary goal of a resume is to get an interview. And then when we talk about the, the primary goal of the cover letter is to get them to look at your resume. So they, they work together, and we'll talk a little bit about how that is. The length of a teacher education resume, what do you think? One page, two page, three page? One page, okay. Anybody say two pages? 
Okay, some people say two pages. Now let me ask you, why do you say one page? Okay, they don't want to look at one page, so keep it to one. Okay, who said, who raised their hand for two pages? Why do you think two pages? Okay, so you've got so much to, so much information to provide, it's hard to do it on a page. Let me, let me make a suggestion. Because I, I understand both points of view, and I think there are going to be those people who look at your resume and they only look at a page. So you want to have the most relevant experience on the first page. You know, where your education is, what your licensure is, what teaching experience you have, and then you can use your second page for possibly other kinds of experiences. Because, remember what I said, your resume is going to be looked at by a, a number of people. And as you go further along into the interview process, people are going to look at that second page because they want to get a full idea of who you are and what your experiences are. So in my opinion, it's OK to have two pages. But keep in mind that there are going to be those people who only want to read a page and have the most important information on the first page. Now, there may be some places that say we only want a page. If that's what they say, that's what you have to do. And that's, that'll be kind of tough. So you may have a one page and a two page. How long does it take to prepare a resume? It should take you a couple of tries. And it should also be an ongoing process. When you do a field placement, when you do student teaching, when you, when you are accepted into a professional um, association, um, when you, you know, get a job. How many of you, does anybody work more than maybe 20 hours a week? Yeah, okay, or, or that. You know, that, that kind of information, if you've gotten a job, you want to make sure that that kind of information is on there. So it's going to take you several times. How much of your background should be included at, at this particular time? I would say high school, what do you think, high school? Probably not high school unless you have worked in a job or you've been involved in an or, a volunteer organization or something since high school and it's something that might be related. How many of you were, were in sports in high school? Okay, how many of you wanna possibly coach or, or include that in? Okay, so a number of you are. That might be included also because again, it's, it's relevant, but you don't wanna spend too much time on it, especially if you, because you're at the expense of at them asking, well, you did a lot in high school, but you didn't do very much in college. So you know, just kind of be aware of that. Usually it's going to be your experience in college, especially when you're a junior or senior. How do you begin? My suggestion is to essentially type out everything. Like what would you include? What do you think is important? Get it down on, on the page. Take a look at it after you get it all down, and then that's when you're gonna start editing. Has anybody used Optimal Resume? No, Optimal Resume is an electronic template that you can find on our webpage. And I'm going to send you a copy of the PowerPoint, and I'll also send you some links to our website. But if you have trouble using Word, or if you want to do kind of a quick uh, resume, this will provide you with a number of templates that you can transfer, and you can you know, cha change the different formats, put it into a PDF. And I would urge you to make sure that whenever you're sending it to someone, or you're or you are applying online to make sure you, you use the PDF so that it doesn't, the format doesn't switch around. So the organization of a resume, and this, this is really important. The traditional format of a resume is reverse chronology. You all are going to be using what's called a chronological resume. But you're going to be using your most recent experience first. Now, if your most recent experience is not your teaching experience, then that would theoretically be the first thing that they see. But since that's not really going to be probably as impressive as your teaching experience, you want to figure out, okay, so what kind of information do I want to apply and what kind of, of topics am I going to do? Now, there are four blocks of information that you want to include on every resume. Your name and address, whether you include your, both your current address and your, your permanent address is up to you. The objective, and the objective is going to be essentially what kind of a teaching position are you looking for. 
and we'll go into that a little bit later. And I know that there is some argument about do I put an objective down, don't I put an objective down. But I say put an objective down because at this point, if I can't tell looking at your resume what you want, put an objective down so I don't, I don't have to guess. What your education is, and again, put your most recent experience first. Don't put high school, although I have been convinced by some students that if you are applying to uh, the same school that you went to, or you have some contact with a person who is going to be interviewing you who went to your high school, maybe, maybe you put it down. Maybe you put it down. But for the most part, no. But if you're applying to your high school, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, because again, I think it, it, it shows that you want to come back, and it, it, people like to see that. And then what your experience is. And th this is going to be a number of topics. So optional, optional headings. References. Used to be that you would put references furnished upon request at the end of your resume. I don't know if any of you remember that. That's not necessary anymore because people know that that's what you're going to do. What I would suggest you do is have a separate reference page. And we'll talk a little bit more about who you should ask, how many names should be on it, and how you actually go about asking them. We'll talk about that in a minute. So you could have teaching experience. You could have professional experience. You could have internships. I would say that you definitely start with your education, or excuse me, start with your objective, go to the education, and then have your teaching experience. OK, so what's going to be under your teaching experience? Obviously, your student teaching. I would, at this point, put down your field experiences. You know, in a couple of years after you've had some teaching experience, you may not put that on, but I would definitely put that on now, especially because my understanding of what Miami does is they put you in different kinds of schools for your field experience, so you get a different experience in each one. And again, don't just do, don't just kind of do a laundry list, but if you are allowed to develop a lesson, if you um, did some kind of a project, those are the kinds of things that you want to focus on. So you can have teaching experience. You could have, let's say you were heavily involved in some student organizations. You, know, you could have that under leadership activities or volunteer activities. And remember, under professional experience or under work experience or under related experience, whatever you call it, it doesn't have to be paid. So if you've done a lot of volunteer work and you want to include it under your teaching experience or related experience, you know, go ahead. Because I think there are a lot of people that do volunteer tutoring and you, you may have done it for a long time. How many of you volunteer? Okay, a lot of you volunteer. And I think that if you volunteer, again, it just gives me a different understanding of who you are and if you would be a good candidate for my position. So the name and address. Indicate both campus and permanent address as a rule. I would say that that's probably the best thing to do. But your permanent address, you might also consider putting, you know, after May 25th, you know, this is what my address is going to be. And make sure that, it, that it's an address that you can be reached at during the summer. So at some point, if you're going to be moving out of your place in Oxford, you might just want to take it off your resume because you want to make sure that they get in touch with you where you're going to be in the summertime. Be consistent with abbreviations. You know, again, one of those picky types of things, but if you spell out road in one case, you want to make sure that you spell it out in another. Include your email address. Most of you probably have one email address. And I don't know if you realize this, but you get to take the Miami one with you. And you also want to make sure that your email address, if you don't use your Miami one, is a professional email address and is not a, um, um, you know, a funny or a somewhat risque one, OK? Because some people like to have a separate you know, Gmail account or whatever for their, their job search, which is fine. But you want to make sure that it's professional. The same with your phone, the, vo the voicemail message on your phone. You want to make sure that is professional. OK, this is just an example. And there are many different, different ways of doing it. Um, your, your current one on the left-hand side, and then your, where you're going to be afterwards on the right-hand side. Career objective. Your career objective or just your objective, because remember, if you're going to be applying on like a consortium's website or you're going to be applying on a place that's AppleTrack, 
They're going to allow you to check off the different kinds of positions that you're interested in. But if you are going to, for example, teach your job fair or you are applying to a specific position, I think it's very important to make it a very customized objective. Be very specific about the position you're applying for. Because if, usually if it's an HR person, they're going to be looking at a lot of different resumes. And they're going to have a lot of different positions open. And it just, it just helps. And it also does provide a focus for the rest of your resume. If I say I'm interested in um, working in K through 3 with an, with an opportunity to coach, then I want to see if this, this person's resume backs up what this person is interested in. So just an example, an elementary school teaching position, preferably grades in grades one through three. I mean, that's, that's a very straightforward example. There are some other ones in, in the book. Education. Okay, Miami University, Oxford, Ohio, you are getting a Bachelor of Science in Education. And it's okay to put the date you're going to graduate. Some people will say, well, I can't put down that I have a Bachelor of Science in Education because I haven't gotten it yet. Well, the fact that you're going to put May 2014, that shows that you're going to be getting it but you don't have it yet. Now this is what I was talking about, your major early childhood education and then certification, Ohio licensure, pre-K through three. If you are thinking about moving someplace else, you want to make sure that you've checked into what the licensure requirements are or certification, some kind of certification, sometimes called licensure. And if you have started that process, let them know. Because if you're moving back, because you notice that person is from Georgia, and if they're moving back home, you want to let whoever's looking at the resume know that you have an understanding of what the certification, what the licensure requirements are going to be. Now, overall GPA, or you can put your GPA in your major. Do not round up your GPA and don't round it down. So if you have a 3.49, put down a 3.49 over a 4.0. You don't have a 3.5, okay? Because they're going to check. And some people are very kind of particular about that, you know, especially for something like grade point average. All right, so you have your address, you have your career objective, and you have your education. And also, if you happen to have a minor, how many of you have a minor? Here, okay. And this is also a good place to put under education, study abroad. Anybody studied abroad? Okay. Anybody stu doing their student teaching abroad? Oh, lucky. Where are you, you going to do your student teaching? To where? Ah, oh, okay. All right. So if you've studied abroad, you can put it, I would suggest that you put it under education and you be specific, especially if it's, if it's education related. And then we'll talk a little bit more about what you want to do for your student teaching. Then honors, you know, if you belong to, if, and again, it's quality and not quantity. If you are in an honors, if you've been given scholarships, et cetera, don't pick the ones that you really, you have no idea about. Because if somebody asks you a question, so tell me a little bit more about this, uh, um, you know, Kappa Delta Pi Education Honor Society, and you've never really gone to a meeting, you know, take it off. But if you have, if you have a real commitment and involvement in it, then, and you can talk about it, put it on. Yes? Abs absolutely. Bachelor of Science in Education, what your major is, and what's your other degree? Creative writing. Okay, so be a Bachelor of Arts? Yeah. Okay, Bachelor of Arts, major creative writing. A absolutely, because that's, I mean, to show that you have a, a double major, that's, that's, uh, you can, okay. you can. In other words, what you probably can do is do your Bachelor of Science in Education, major, you know, whatever, early childhood, and then put your GPA, and then do Bachelor of, Sci Bachelor of Arts in Creative Writing. I mean, there, there are a number of different ways that, that you can do it, or put them both together and then do your GPA, but absolutely, if you've double majored, if you've minored, you want to make sure you put that on your resume. Okay, now teaching experience. And there are some different examples in the guide. But the thing I want to point out, and I wouldn't say this is necessarily the best, but again, don't make it a laundry list. You want to put down student teacher, what the grades were, when you did it, the name of the school. You don't have to put the street address, but, but where it's located. And then again, if you were responsible for 
developing a, a teaching unit. Think about describing it in terms of what the content was, what the methodology was, and how did you assess it. You know, the, the clearer you can be and the more information. You know, so again, if you brought in technology, if you used a specific theory, um, you know, talk about that rather than, you know, I was responsible for teaching, you know, three English classes. That doesn't tell me a lot. But if you developed a unit, you know, using this particular theory or you developed a unit and you tell a little bit about it, it'll give me more of an idea of, of what you're capable of and what, what, um, what you've already done. Does that, does that make sense? So don't just kind of do a laundry list, which I think some resumes are. You want to be a little more specific. So, and what includes teaching experience? You know, it could be this person was a Sunday school teacher. It could be some of you, if you tutor. Um, how many of you have worked in a camp where you did have, where you, you had teaching responsibilities? Okay, you know, you might even include that. Or that could also be included under related experience, something like that. This is another formatting alternative. The one, this one is paragraph form. And this one is bullet form. Which do you like better? Bullet, yeah, I do, I do too. But the paragraph form doesn't take as much room. However, I think the bullet formatting is much more conducive to that 10 seconds. So if you have a choice, and, and you do, because it's your resume, you know, do a bullet point rather than that. All right, action words. When you are describing what you've done, you want to use action words. So it wouldn't be, you don't use full sentences, you know, I did this. It would be, you know, taught or developed a lesson in this. Or, you know, coordinated, designed, and implemented. That's, that's how you're going to do the action words. And if you go on our website or you pick up one of our resume guides, and it's, it's going to look a little bit like it's going to be yellow like this. It's not the teacher one, but it's the other one. It's going to have about 300 suggested action words. And I think, does this one have one? I don't know if this one has an action word. I don't think it does. But there are many, many ways of saying the same thing. And how you, you know, the action word kind of gives it a power punch, right? Okay, other experience. You know, again, lifeguard, or it could be if you've had a summer job because you've put yourself through school, you know, include that, but don't, but include it on the second page. Don't include it at the top. It's not that this is not important, because it is. In fact, I may, as a human resource person, call your boss and ask, you know, did this person show up on time? What were they like with, you know, irate customers? Because what you did in a job in retail is probably going to be very telling about how you're going to deal with you know, um, students that are a little disruptive or parents that are disruptive. So don't think that it's not important, but again, where you put it on the resume is, is what really counts. So remember what I was talking about before? The person who looks at it first is going to want to know what my education is and what my student teaching is. But the people who are talking to me in an interview are probably going to want to know a little bit more about me. And have you ever heard of transferable skills? Transferable skills are skills that you've developed that can be transferred to other situations. So for example, as I was talking about before, if you've worked in retail or if you've worked in food service, you've worked in a bar uptown in a college community, you've probably developed some really good conflict resolution skills communication skills with difficult people. You know, again, those are the kinds of skills that can be very transferable to, you know, to different situations. So think about it in terms of that. All right, campus activities. Now again, quality versus quantity. You don't want to just list every single organization that you were in, including what you were in first year for the first semester and only went to one meeting. What were ones that you participated in? Which ones might you have had leadership experience? So make them, again, it's substantive. It's, it's not the quantity. Employers aren't impressed by the fact that you've been in 10 clubs. They're much more impressed by the fact that um, you, know, you were involved on campus as an RA, or maybe as a tour guide, or 
even a sorority or a fraternity, again, if you had some leadership skills. References. You should probably have three to five references. And I would say, pro oops, I would say probably the best references are going to be those who have observed you teaching. So certainly your supervising teacher, your cooperating teacher, and maybe some of your professors, you know, again, if they've observed you teaching. If you have worked someplace for a long time, I would also include, include that person. Because remember what I was talking about before, you know, if, if you are a recent graduate, I'm going to call your boss and I'm going to find out probably a lot about you and, and what your work ethic is and, and what you do well. So I would include that. Now, for anybody who's in education, your professors or any of the teachers or principals, et cetera, you want to make sure that you find out what their summer uh, contact information is. If, assuming that that's when you're going to be looking, because most of the jobs that you're going to be looking for will be available in the summer. So if they're going to be contacting your references, you want to make sure they can get in touch with them quickly. Now, and th this is really very important. Never ever put somebody on your reference page without checking to make sure it's okay. And I wouldn't just say, hey, can I use you as a reference? And then they say, sure, no problem. I would ask very specifically something like, do you think you know me well enough to be able to give me a positive reference? That's just a suggestion. If you are with your cooperating teacher or your um, supervising teacher, they're pro you probably are going to get into a conversation with them about what they're going to talk about in terms of, of a reference. My point is, Whatever you do, make sure you talk to them. Make sure they have a copy of your resume. Make sure that they agree. And keep them in the loop. If they're somewhat, if, again, that's why you want to make sure you have their summer information. So that if, for example, um, you need to get in touch with them quickly, you can do that. So they need to agree. Give them a copy of your resume. Keep them in the loop. If you gave somebody your reference sheet and you know that they're going to be checking your references, email the person, call them up and say, hey, I just applied for a position with the Lakota School District. I think that Ms. Jones is going to be calling you or sending you an email or filling out a form so that they'll be on their toes. Because some people don't always look at their, their emails or they don't always look at their, um, I know it's hard to believe, um, they may not always look at their phone. So you want to make sure that they're, they're going to be aware. And thank them. And when you get a position, let them know. Because you can't underestimate the influence that a reference may have had. You know, it could be there could be three candidates, all of them good candidates, but your references blew them away. So thank them and let them know that you you got a job and you got a position. Okay. This is just an example of what you might want to put down. And again, that's in the book: the name of the reference, their job, the position, et cetera, and their contact information. And you use the same header. That you do on your re that you did on your resume, so when you're doing when you're working on your resume and you're making the final edits, make sure that somebody else looks at it. I'm happy to look at it. We've got uh, walk-in hours, resume walk-in hours, and you can look at the times on our, our website for you to drop in, and there are trained students who can take a look at your resume, especially if you've never had anybody look at it before. Have your teachers look at it. Um, if you're student teaching and you've got a good relationship with the principal, ask the principal if, if he or she will take a look at it. You can never have too many opinions. However, if you ask five people their opinion about your resume, they're going to give you five different answers. So ultimately, it's up to you. And here are some kind of very picky types of things, but make sure that you're, you use, if, you're, if you no longer are working in a position or you're no longer in a club, use past tense. If you're currently in it, then you use current tense. So again, that's one of those things. And don't use slang. So if you're in a fraternity, you're in an organization, don't put down the acronym for it. Spell it out and then put the acronym. Because not everybody's going to know what, what it is. Layout suggestions. Keep your resume to two pages. You want to make sure that when you look at it, the formatting is consistent. So if you have captions down the side, 
and they should and one of them is bolded they should all be bolded if your school districts are one of them is underlined they all should be underlined and you want to make sure that that you use the white space on your resume correctly and some of this is preference but you want to have somebody take a look at it make sure that your resume looks good so you want to use paper that is one or two steps above paper that you would use to make copies <clears throat> color I would say be rather conservative no pink maybe blue but I would say probably to be safe white um, off-white maybe gray maybe tan but you want it to be relatively conservative no pictures no pictures of you okay I once had a student who said my mother said I'm so pretty I should put my picture on there and I said oh please don't um, do not put your picture on it. This is not your Facebook account, so don't put it on. And, and this is very, very important, make sure that your resume is error-free. People don't notice when it's error-free, but they notice when there is an error. And that's, that's, kind of, you know, that's kind of too bad. And that's why I said, please make sure that you have somebody read it, because after a certain point, you've looked at it a million times, and it looks okay to you, and then you find that you've misspelled your own name or something, something like that. All right, cover letters. So again, a resume is going to have somebody, it's going to make somebody want to interview you, and your cover letter is going to give them additional information that complements your resume that's going to make them want to look at your resume even further. Now, if you are applying online, or you're applying using AppleTrack, et cetera, you may be allowed to do a rather generic cover letter, and, and, and that's fine. I think it's very important to do a cover letter when you can because this will give you an opportunity to be specific about some of the contributions that you've made. Talk in further detail about your you know, study abroad or your teaching, your student teaching abroad and what you've learned and after you've researched a student, certain school district and you find out that they too um, are trying to incorporate this certain kind of technology that you have some experience in, you know, include that. So your cover letter allows you to complement what you have on your resume. Because remember, your resume is those bullet points. It's very kind of matter of fact. And your cover letter can allow you to customize. Now, you do not want to have a cover letter that I can tell is a form. So it wouldn't be to whom it may concern. It wouldn't be, you know, dear sir, dear ma'am. Hopefully, if you are getting to the point where you're not sending it on AppleTrack, you're not doing one of the consortiums, if you know that there's a position open up in a particular school and you don't know who is the person that you should send or get in contact with, call them up. Call up the school district. Talk to the, to the secretary and say, you know, my name is Jennifer McLaughlin. I, am, I understand there's a position open and I'd like to send it to the proper person. You know, what's the name of the person? And then you can address it to dear Ms. so-and-so, dear Mr. so-and-so, dear Dr. so-and-so. And it shows that you've done your homework. So personalize your cover letters. Don't, you know, again, <clears throat> do your research on the school district. If you, you know, name, actually put in the body of the cover letter the name of the position, and then you go from there. You know, why would you be a good candidate? What do you have to offer? And there are some examples in the employment guide of a cover letter, as well as in the 2014 job search handbook by AAEE. And this, again, this is just, this is just an example. But you want to make sure that you have your return address at the top and the date that you send it. Now, this may be an email, in which case, you know, you would change it a little bit, or it may be, you know, something that you send by snail mail. But if you send your resume via email to someone, which in some certain circumstances is fine, you want to make sure that your email is formal. You know, this is not going to be an email that you would send to a friend. This is going to be a business letter that you put in email or that you send via snail mail. So, your name's at the top. You want to, you know, again, you'll notice that it's addressed to a person. They have the title, their address is there, and then Dear Ms. Jarvis Colon. Not comma, but colon. And again, I know that's, that's really picky, but how many of you, I mean, we really don't write business letters anymore. So this is the one time that you're going to be doing it. And then the first paragraph, why you're writing, be specific, where did you find out about it? 
Second paragraph, and this I don't think this is a particularly strong second paragraph, but it fits on the screen. You know, what, what you bring to the table, why you're interested, and you know, again, this would be an opportunity to talk a little bit more possibly about some experiences you had that are related, and then how you're going to follow up. And this is where I think a lot of people feel that they are bothering someone if they actually follow up. And this is what I, I think that, think of it this way. You know there's a position opened up. If somebody told you about it, maybe a relative or a friend is a teacher there, maybe you know the principal of a, another school who told you about it, name drop in, in the first paragraph. I forgot, to, I forgot to mention that. Now, okay, so follow up. Follow up can be a couple of different ways. It can be that you're gonna call the school district office just to make sure that they've received your resume and cover letter and then ask what's the next step? When do you plan on making a decision about who to invite for an interview? Because if I've got a big stack of resumes, which I probably do, then I might just pull yours out. Now if it's in a computer, if it's you know, the Apple track or the consortium, you probably can't do that. But it's, it's still when given an opportunity you want to follow up. You want to make some kind of personal contact. And we'll talk a little bit more about that during the next one, making employer contacts and interviewing. Because education, you know, it's kind of, it's, education is, is, as I keep saying, is a little bit different. Yes, they use technology, but it's a very personal field. And, you know, how do you, how do you separate yourself? And that's hopefully one of the things that we'll talk about. All right, so, you know, again, we talked about the first paragraph. I'm interested in being considered for an elementary teaching vacancy, which may develop. Actually, this is kind of a general one. Talk about that you're going to be graduating. You mentioned, since this is going to be in Georgia, that you are from Georgia. So why you're writing, how you found out about the position, and mention any referrals. Then the middle paragraph. You want to refer to your resume. You want to highlight the skills that are relevant to the school position. And you want to indicate how you can make a contribution. And your cover letter is also another example of how well you write. So you're going to spend some time. How well you write, how much research you've done, what you know about the school district, how you're going to be able to contribute. So in the middle paragraph, you talk a little bit about what, what you've done, what your background is, and, what, and the fact, this, and I think this is important, she is from Atlanta and she's applying for a job in Atlanta, so she mentions that. So it's not like you're somebody from another state going to another state. Closing paragraph, how and when you plan to follow up. Indicate that you have an interest in meeting with them. And then again, thank them for their time and their consideration. You know, I know it seems a little bit formal and a little bit stiff, but that's, you know, again, that's, that's what you want to do when you are writing a cover letter. And then also, if you have completed an online application, you want to make sure they know that you understand, I've completed an online application, um, but I just wanted to follow up with this letter and see if I can possibly, you know, talk to you a little bit more about the position. You know, it, it, it can't hurt. <clears throat> and then very truly yours. Um, sincerely, etc. Use standard white or ivory paper, or I said, as I said, maybe tan or maybe you know a light gray. But you want to use the same paper for your resume as you do for your cover letter. Type all correspondence that includes your your envelope. You don't want to handwrite that. And again, I know this. I know this is picky, but you can either send it in a legal size envelope where you you fold it into threes. Or, and some people feel very strongly about this, put it in a larger one where you don't fold it and they say, well, it's going to stand out on people's desk. Maybe that, maybe that works, maybe it doesn't, but for the most part, so many of your applications are going to be done online that it, this may not be something that's going to come up. But make sure you keep a copy of all the correspondence because remember, you're going to follow up if you can. And that's whether it's online or not. You need to make sure you track it in some way or another. Otherwise, you're going to wonder, what, what happened to that? Why, why haven't I heard from them? That's why I think it's so important to you know, say, I'm going to follow up, or um, you know, try to find out a little bit more about you know, who you can contact. Yes? Do you recommend the same one as 
Yes, in fact, I should have said that, but yes, you know, I plan, I will contact you during the week of maybe give yourself 10 business days, and rather than say a specific date, maybe, you know, during the week of March 20th, so you give yourself some time, and then do it, you know, and then do follow up. We have in this guide and in the other guide examples of cover letters, and you can find a lot, a lot online. I used to have a boss who said looking good on paper is the key to generating interviews and attention to detail is critical. And it, re it, it really is. And, it, and again, it's such a, you know, looking for a job is not always what we consider to be pleasant, but there are sort of rules that go along with it that you have to learn as you go along. And you need to, you need to follow those, those rules and guidelines. Um, in order to be considered for different positions. <clears throat>